You are listening to the One Day at a Time podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hey friend, thank you for downloading this episode and hanging out with us today. If you hear some snoring, that's just my English bulldog, Ted. I didn't have the heart to kick him out, so he's hanging out with us today too. So today's question, can you get sober for someone else? There's a lot of debate around the idea of getting sober for someone else. And in this episode, I have a conversation with Paul Summers Jr., who is a returning guest. He is the author of Hide and Seek, A Dad's Journey from Soulless Addiction to Soul Custody. So Paul is going to share his story of drug addiction, how he got sober for his daughter, and the fight to save her from an addict mother. Before we jump in, I wanted to share an idea that has really helped a lot of my clients as they work towards breaking old behavior patterns and achieving some really big goals, and that is the law of 51%. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by changes that you want to make or goals that you want to achieve. That feeling of overwhelm can keep you from taking action, which keeps you feeling stuck. Think of a balance scale and what it takes to tip the balance. It's just a little more on one side than the other. So the law of 51% states that all you need to tip the scale is just a little more progress in the direction that you're headed in. The big takeaway here is that you are closer to your goal than you think. With some tools, some support, and a little practice, you can reach that goal that you've been struggling with. This is just one of the lessons from my six-week class called Reinvent Yourself. Listen, we all know what to do, but we just don't do it. Why? The answer is resistance. The magic is that we actually do the exercises in class together to break through that resistance and to help you build momentum. Class starts Thursday, October 3rd at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I only teach this class three times a year and space is very limited, so don't miss out. As a little incentive, if you sign up by Friday, you can bring a friend for free. To register, head on over to selfesteemcourse.com and let me know if you have any questions. So that's it for announcements. Please enjoy this episode with Paul. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining me again. Yay. Thank you, Arlena, for having me. Yes. Excited. Me too. And thank you so much for being a guinea pig for our coaching call experiment. That was actually really profound. Uh, I got a lot of really positive feedback. I think it was so helpful for people to see what the process of IFS looks like and and how it can help to resolve some of those internal conflicts. How was that experience for you? I was going to say two things. One, it was life-changing. Um Ooh. Yeah, it it definitely was. In fact, on my my bathroom mirror in my in my bedroom, um, I put a little sticky note that says "I am worthy," and I touch it every day and say it out loud. You know, like like football teams go, yeah, when they hit the, <laughs> the oh, I just hit myself in the head. Okay, anyway, and the, the other thing is full disclosure: I have been afraid to listen back to that that we did. So I mean, listen, you experienced it. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I, you know how it is, like you you sometimes learn, you know, when you're in the moment, especially doing something that cathartic, you know, uh, um, and, and knowing that it's being filmed, you know, videoed yeah. and, and yeah. it's like, Oh, Oh, you know, should I give my good face answer or be real? Every time I'm real, I get helped. Okay. I'll be real. But you know, I'm caught up in that moment. I'm in that moment. And, yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. So I need to listen back to it. I know I do. Yeah. I've been scared. What's the worst thing that could happen if you listen back? Uh, I'll grow. Oh, <laughs> but I don't just be like I don't know. Do you do you feel that way sometimes? Like oh, growing yeah. is like I'm afraid of it sometimes. You know, I mean it's yeah. Uh-oh. I've sort of developed this. Maybe it's kind of strange, but this feeling of running towards the fire now. Okay. In a way, because um, if I find, if I notice that I'm uncomfortable with something, I go, ooh, that, you know, the treasure you seek is in the cave you fear to enter, right? Yeah. Yeah. What we try to avoid, we end up actually creating the circumstances that attracts it. Yeah, I know that. I mean, so yeah, we can know these things intellectually, but emotionally, you know, we, we, you know, 
there's the fear, which the fear of discomfort, of pain, you know, and, and so we don't want to feel that pain. So we avoid. And right. I I just got tired of always, you know, running from certain kinds of pain. So, so I've sort of over time developed this like, I notice that I don't want to do something. I go, oh, that's where, and there's always something amazing that happens on the other side. And so kind of that's what I hang on to. That is, that is so true for me right now. Uh, I don't know when you and I talk, we just like, it just I flows. Know, so, I know. so but, uh, for, for me right now, like my go-to was always anger. Like if something was scary to me, I could puff up and, you know, pretend it's not scary to me. Yeah. And, uh, face it head on in a negative way. And now I sit with stuff that like, like you said, it, you know, you see it coming. You, I, I, you know, I have this, uh, this self-awareness where it's like, okay, I feel, I feel it in my body even. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and instead of like, okay, here's, uh, I can feel my tent. I feel it tense up. And, and now I, I just, I, uh, I pause and look at it, uh, you know the way i've always looked at it because i have these old these old worn filters you know right, right. and then and then because i i know that's gonna happen i'm gonna look at it the way i always look at it but then i give it a little bit more of a push to look at it under a different perspective and then that's yeah and then you see that change and you see like mm -hmm. oh you know the way you always dealt with it was to you know combat it or uh defend yourself against it and now it's like allow it you know allow yeah that's amazing. I love that. Um, what a gentle way of, I mean, I saw as you were talking about like your shoulders drop and like, yeah, yeah we have the embodied experience and that is what's, what's really needed is to get out of our head and get into our heart and operate from that place, which is a retraining, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It's we're going to talk about your book today. I'm holding yeah, it up hey. for those of you who are watching this on YouTube. I guess I should say for those of you listening, I'm holding the book up. <laughs> People on YouTube will see right. it. Um, and this, listen, well done on the book. This is no Thank small you. feat. Um, congratulations. This is a very difficult thing to do is to pour out your heart, so to speak. And and this will be a vehicle for other people to go from, you know, you know, it's called Hide and Seek, um, A Dad's Journey from Soulless Addiction to Soul Custody. And, you know, we always pray for the children caught in the crossfire at meetings and things like that. But what about the parents who are trying to navigate this process, right? And so yeah. um, this really sounds like, you know, and you and I were talking before about a way of staying clean no matter what, no matter the challenging experiences that you had going through this whole custody battle. So I thought we would start, I usually start with a little fun game I like to play um, called a lightning round, which is very slow. I haven't done it in a little while. Um, <laughs> but if we think about back to when you first got sober, were there any books that really helped you? Um, definitely Amy Dresner's My Fair Junkie. Um, that was probably the probably the one that really like um spoke to me because she's so you know raw and real um i i immerse myself in you know memoirs because that's how i relate to i don't know just relating with other authors it's like being in a meeting you you, you know you hear yourself in them yeah you you know they lived the story that you're living there's no you know shame or guilt or or uh uh it, it uh, I want to say there's transparency. There's not, right. you know, hiding of self or, uh, you know, marketing of recovery. It's it's a story. It's a story they lived. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, that one really spoke to me just because of, uh, boy, how many times she tried and failed and uh, the madness that she, you know, became as a person in her addiction and yeah. then the freedom that she experienced outside of it. And then um, like following her being, you know, her fanboy. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but kind of, uh, you know, her, uh, God, all she's been going through in the last couple of years. And she's still staying clean, still staying sober. 
yeah. and still working through things, you know, and mm-hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a testament that that book is, is a, uh, you know, story for the ages really. Yeah, no, I, I love Amy. She, I had her on the podcast and the book first came out and I, when I read it, I mean, I couldn't put it down. Yeah. So same. good. Just, and she's so funny. Oh my God. She's exactly. so funny. But yeah, she's uh, such a great writer. So um, yeah, I'll list that in the show notes, her previous sure. episode and a link to her book. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, do you have a go-to mantra or quote, something that keeps coming up for you since you've been sober? Uh, yeah, I think it's a one of my favorite authors uh, of all time is Hermann Hess. He's an old german philosopher uh and his his writing he wrote the book steppenwolf and damien and uh there's a quote that uh only the this is not word for word only the values that we're willing to live are of any value or only the dreams and goals that we're willing to live are of any value and it's like that's really like an action statement you know you you uh you know as people in recovery, we know we were always full of best intentions right. and we, you know, always put a lot of energy into con- try, really trying to convince ourselves that we were going to do the right thing. And then we, we fell short. And, and that, so that one comes up for me a lot, it, you know, cause those old behaviors, they slowly dissipate, you know, they really do. <laughs> no, I love that quote. I mean, Yeah, the whole program is, you know, getting sober is about taking action, right? A lot of times contrary action. So those are really the things that have value. So I love that quote. That's a good one. Um, Do you have a regular self-care practice? It could be like a morning routine or maybe think of it weekly. What does that look like for you? It's, it's, uh, It's reading of the literature. So whether that is, um, it, basically, like a just for today, it doesn't have to be of any program. Hazelden has one, NA has one, AA has one, but it's reading something every morning that uh, reinforces growth and step work uh, and fellowship. And then I have a prayer that I say every morning to my higher power. Nice. I love that. Um, and what do you wish you knew when you first got sober? (laughs) Wow. Uh, that I could do it. Mm. I so believed that I was just like the, the saying, fake it till you make it just seemed preposterous to me. It seemed like, I don't want to be a part of this program if they're talking about faking it like i want this to be so real i want it got to be real but you know it takes time to get there and you you know i mean we find out that our part oh it's this this is a duality thing we never know we got it you know like i i have to remind myself you know I mean, you have 30 years, right? 30. Mm-hmm. I've yeah. got seven, 17 years. Like, I don't, I don't know. I got this and that's the only way I can keep doing it. Yeah. So, you know, I, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. In your 30 years, um, do you notice that there are certain years that people go back out more than others? Um, I mean, I want to say no, because okay. um, I feel like the begin the first five years is rough. Like maybe, yeah. maybe the first five years, there is some in and out, but for every, for every stage, there's, there's that saying, no matter how far down the road you go, you're still the same distance from the ditch. Oh yeah. 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 So I have seen people drop off at 25 years okay you know, 30 years or whatever. So it, statistics are a funny thing. If they happen to you, it's a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. So yeah. for every example I could give you there, there will be, I can just hear the voices being like, yeah, but so-and-so relapsed after this time and so-and-so, or I've seen, like I've, you know, heard people say around the eight or nine, but huh. 
I don't know that that's true. Like we don't like, um, what's that saying? Uh, situational is not causation. Okay. You know, or so I, I, that's a really hard question to answer because if it happens to you, it's a hundred percent. But what I true. have seen, and I think the book talks about this is that there's a certain number of people who get sober right away and stay sober forever. And then there's a part, a percentage of people who, you know, relapse for a period of time and then achieve long-term sobriety. And then you see those people who struggle for years to get sober. They get, they're just on that relapse cycle for years. But even those people have hope. I have a friend who probably struggled for 10 years with constant relapse before he, mm. and now he's yeah. probably got, you know, 20 years sober. Okay. So it, it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I should should have prefaced the question, I guess, a little bit. Um, my wife tells me I do that a lot where I, I'll ask a question, but I already, I have the answer already. And so oh, what do you have? She, she feels like she's having to guess my answer and it's like, okay, that's not fair. You're right. You know? <laughs> so, so I, and, and like you said, it, it, like my experience has been, uh, like right around five years, right around 12 years, right around 20 years. Like I've seen like people with good, well, I don't know what you would call good recovery, but like those are like milestones where I noticed this, but I think you're right. Like somewhere between eight and nine. And I, I, I don't know why I brought it up. It was like intuitively a question I thought to ask you this morning. Yeah. Cause, I, yeah. cause I'm curious. Cause, cause when I was in, in my 12th or 13th year, I had heard so many of so many people that relapsed during that period, Interesting. you know, that in their 12th year. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I heard that mm. because now I know this is maybe even normal to go through because I was going through a lot of a lot of like conflict and relationships and things like that. And I was like, okay, well, maybe this is something, you know, as addict alcoholics, we sort of set up during this period, you know, oh, I got this. I already made 10 years. I'm good. You know, I'm not an <laughs> I'm not an alcoholic anymore. <laughs> you know, anyway, I brought I brought it up maybe to help somebody, you yeah. know, you know, there might be it's a great question, actually. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, that's really good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about how we got here. Um, tell me a little bit, just briefly, what it was like. Um, I'm always curious about people's childhood because I always feel like that sets the stage for everything else to come. What was your family like when you were growing up? Well, I'm the youngest. Uh, I had I have two older brothers, um, five and six years older than me. So I was like very much the youngest and, uh, my mom and dad, I mean, they were married 60 plus years. Um, I would probably not define my dad as an alcoholic, but he drank every day. I've seen him drunk maybe three times in my life, maybe four. So, um, functional, very functional. Um, he had anger issues and was, physically and mentally abusive. Um, and my mom was a workaholic. So she was, she, her first job, she got her first job just after I was born and had it for 25 years. So, wow. uh, <laughs> so she became the breadwinner, um, but not around much, you know, she had the type of job that they called on her late nights and things like that. So what did your mother her, do? She worked in banking, so she started off as a teller, and she ended up in the uh, what would you call it, the, like the processing center. So uh, big IBM machines and things like that. Like uh -huh. she ended up getting into that. So interesting. So she's like on the technical side. Yeah, yeah. And then um, she worked up to become this, you know, this glass ceiling for women. It's so real. And, you know, the, the, the not funny thing about that is her three boys suffered as a result financially, as a result of, she was doing everything the vice president was doing, but she wouldn't get the title because she was a woman. This is, you I know, seven seventies, eighties banking world, you know, and, yeah, and, uh, uh, so yeah. Yeah. And so what kind of, um, you mentioned, you know, your dad having a lot of anger issues, physically, most emotionally abusive. Um, do you have examples of that? Like what, in what ways? Uh, you know, I got to say, you know, I don't want to talk about this as a victim. Um, I worked a lot of stuff out with my dad. He's, you know, he, 
he was the type of person to say, oh, all that, you know, all that crap about my, it's my parents' fault. That's such BS, you know. Um, but we had conversations where, you know, hey, dad, that hurt, you know, or like, I still have issues feeling worthy. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so it was a matter of, uh, you know, like one thing that will always ring out in my head that he would say was, no, 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 Polly. Uh, I was, I'm Paul Jr. So, you know, I was mm. Polly and, and, uh, um, just that no, 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 no. You know, it's like sometimes I hear that when I'm about to do something I've never done or that takes mm -hmm. confidence, you know. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it came out in those ways. I mean, he had he had rage issues um where uh you know something would set him off and we would uh scurry away in fear, you know. Uh mm -hmm. but but him and I definitely had a lot of uh you know bat like just friction that yeah. we worked that, that we worked out like how is that what you said or no i was just saying yeah it's it's tough like when you're when you're little and you're the one that confronts the parent usually there's one at least one child in the family that will confront the parent and do battle yeah i well so what i got to see was my oldest brother was kind of the pet that did everything dad said you know um and the other one was the one that confronted him all the time and I got to watch that and cut, sort of balance it. And, and so it, I, I think that led to me having like this personality of like joking with people, because I know I could be liked if I joked with people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that became my, I believe people pleasing, uh, and way to, you know, escape was like, well, I could always like joke with my dad and then I'm on his good side, you know? So. Right. Right. Yeah. You learn ways to be okay in a house that is maybe not safe necessarily i mean i i know i felt small in that house yeah you know? yeah yeah and it's so interesting because it feels like um you know our our parents change as we get older too right we change That's true. they change and yeah and so it's sometimes difficult to talk about like you never want to blame your parents or maybe some people do but it's like and it's not we're not blaming so much as acknowledging reality yeah, right. It's exactly. just a, acknowledging the facts like this is what happened. This is how I was affected. And then we don't live there. We move to the place of and this is how I these are the things I took action on that helped me to heal. So that's typically why I ask that, because <laughs> there's a lot of people I would I would imagine most people that are in recovery. The majority of the people in recovery did not have healthy relationships with their with their parents. So yeah, yeah, it's I always see that. helpful to hear. Yeah, it's and, always and, helpful and, to hear. And and to add one thing is when I say we had friction, that was that was, you know, I was afraid. I was terrified of his rage for sure. I mean, from a like philosophical standpoint, him and I got along really, really well. You know, mm -hmm. we traded ideas and values and uh I, I mean I can think of one time when I said to him you know, dad, you're always trying to tell me how to live, but you haven't been a, a, a good example because he, you know, and, and he was like, wow, you know, I mean, I can't imagine my, my kid telling me that, you know, but I was right. If you, you know, put it under certain, you know, uh, lenses, like he never had a, he was committed to a job. He worked all the time. So he was a provider, but he wasn't a very good provider. Mm depending on what you want to call that, you know, <clears throat> but so those kind of things, I could say those kind of things, to my dad, and he would be, he wouldn't be like, you, I don't, I don't, you know, he would, <laughs> he would, yeah, he, he would, he would just be like, wow, but, you know, and he would take it, take it, take it like a man, as he would say, you know, um, it was more as, uh, I got older, um, that I confronted him on things that he did. And, uh, and sometimes I was like the abusive one, mm. you know, I mean, it's kind of odd. We're doing this podcast, this coming up this weekend, I'm doing uh, a sound healing at this outdoor amphitheater, which is right by this hotel. And one of the last times my dad came to visit up here where I live, um, he was staying at our house and he got really upset that, uh, it was cold in our house. And he's like, I'm getting a hotel room. And that was so, so uh, painful for me that for the first time, you know, after getting sober, after rebuilding my life, 
I, I remarried. I, and my wife and I got this really beautiful house. So the first time in my life, I have something to say, Hey family, come stay with me. Mm -hmm. Cause I never had anything like this. And his first time here, he's like, you know, this is crap. I'm going to go get a hotel room. I was so offended, so offended. Yeah. And I, I drove him to the hotel room and I said, and I said, I'm going to come, I'll come pick you up when you go, when your flight, you know, leaves in two days. And he was like, what? And I was like, you know, F you man. Like, and I, and I, I mean, I still feel regret to this day that I blasted him. I blasted the crap out of him. And like, yeah, I, 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 maybe I showed him him. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, I'm trying to get out of it. Yeah. It was not cool. I, you know, and I lost it on him. And, uh, anyway, I don't, it's just yeah. that, that came up recently because I went over to the amphitheater and I'm like, oh my God, that's where, that's the bench where I was screaming at. So it's screaming at my dad who was yeah. at that time, you know, in his eighties dying of cancer. And it's like, <laughs> man, you know, not cool. Not, you know, anyway. Any, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. We... <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Compartmentalize that again. Uh, <laughs> Let's just put that away. No, I appreciate you sharing that because just because you get sober doesn't mean that, you know, we don't get triggered. Right. Right. And, yeah. And, and pain. and and anger those are really big triggers yeah you know so we need to stay sober through all of those too let's uh, talk a little bit about you know how did you like when did you start drinking or using how old were you yeah i would say i was a late bloomer i mean the first time i had a drink i was probably 14 my i was at my brother's apartment and uh i got so drunk that i was throwing up um and I think I did it again at 16, got so drunk I was throwing it, you know, it was the the one, is <laughs> a thousand never enough, like right away, just like, oh, oh, this tastes good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vomit. Huh. Maybe I won't do that. And then uh, at 19, I started playing bars and uh, I would say by 20, my alcoholism probably was kicking in. Uh, I had tried drugs a couple times but um when i was 26 i w i didn't start doing drugs so i was in my late 20s okay. so um what kind of drugs and, did you start with or did you uh, drug of choice as they say well i mean it started out as meth and uh and then became opiates and then mixtures of them mm -hmm. and when you were probably, in your late 20s yeah. Yeah. And early thirties for sure. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of psychedelic use, uh, abuse, use, abuse, <laughs> yeah. psychedelics, you know, um, mm -hmm. gosh. And then like every combination you can think of, you know, from there on out, like by the time I was in my mid thirties, I was full blown into, you know, wanting to, uh, get high most of the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. When did you decide it was a problem? Well, with alcohol, it was, uh, I think I was 27 and I was playing bars like five nights a week. And, uh, this is in Las Vegas and in Vegas, I mean, you played bars, you got free drinks all night. And, mm -hmm. um, I just like, oh my gosh, all my behaviors were harmful to myself and others. And, uh, there was, it was a Christmas, Christmas Eve, um, playing a gig with my band and I just, I end up in the bar because bars are 24 hours in vegas i end up in the bar sun's coming up i'm still there milking a drink um all alone the bartender he's like he's doing uh his side work there's nobody there and he finally just says hey bro it's christmas morning don't you have somewhere you got to be and i was like oh oh yeah 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 and i don't know how i drove home but i i did and um that day I was going to be at my family's house. I had a girlfriend I was living with and her mom and dad had a bitter divorce, but they had agreed because we were living together that they would try to do a, a, a Christmas together with everybody, which had been the first time in like 10 years with this family. Anyway, I, I, I show up to my, my parents' house, my brother's there with his kids, uh, their friends are there. And I just start throwing up all over the place. And, oh, no. uh, yeah, I mean, a really poor shoveling <laughs> to say the least. And I mean, I'm, I'm so, I'm so drunk that I, I can't, I can't go anywhere. Like, like probably alcohol poisoning, uh, mm. drunk. And my girlfriend's just like, oh my God, you know, my parents, this, 
you know how much this means to me. You you can't, you got to go. And I was like, I can't, I, I'm too wasted. And so, uh, I had quit drinking on that day or the, you know, um, for 12 years from that. And wow. then, and what brought me back to drinking was my opioid addiction had gotten so bad that I thought, well, maybe if I try drinking again, I'll be okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Yeah. The insanity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and that, uh, and that happened during the, the period that the, the memoir is written about. It okay. was, you know, that, that bartering, that like, oh, well, you know, I, I can't seem to quit the opiates. Maybe if I drink again, I can still take the edge off life. And Right. Yeah. And so what did you do to, like, what happened to finally make you quit everything? What happened was, um, you know, a series of events, really. Um, and and they're detailed in, in hide and seek. Mm -hmm. um, starting with like having a kid, having my daughter and, you know, that, uh, blurry realization because I'm on substances every day, you know, by then it's like, I needed opiates or I would have withdrawals doing, doing speed, doing meth was, you know, every few days, but you know, when you do meth, you're up for a few days. So it was like, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, trying to get an even keel with drinking or opiates. And, you know, it, the foggy realization, like, this isn't good for my kid. And I can't stop. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm ruining her life. And I would rather be dead than quit. Mm -hmm. You know, these feelings of like, death is probably the answer here. You know, wow. I can't, I, yeah. I can't quit. I couldn't quit on my own. And so I went to, I called a suicide hotline and, um, and they convinced me, they tried to convince me to go to treatment. Um, I was like, I can't be away from my daughter. There's that rationalization, you know, um, you know, in retrospect, it was like, well, I was using her as a way of not fully committing to mm. treatment. Yeah. And uh, so I, I agreed to an outpatient treatment and in outpatient treatment, I was introduced to Narcotics Anonymous uh, and, uh, and, you know, my first meeting, I was like, oh my gosh, these people are talking like I talk, they're thinking like I think. And I, you know, I, I, I think for all of us who are uh, a little used to recovery, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But if you're totally new to recovery, like that was like, oh my God, I, I'm not alone. Right. I always thought I was. I really thought like nobody understands me and the reasons I do what I do. And then here were people like saying my story. And and so that was that was uh, that was good. It, it, I, I put together 60 days, something like that. And I was like, I, I had taken my gosh, my daughter was uh, two at the time. So bringing her to meetings and two years old, you know, she wants to get, you know, all over the place and you know, you know, blessings, or <laughs> blessings, blessings to those who offer to watch, uh, kids at meetings, Yeah, you know, so grateful for that, but uh, and there's no, but to that, um, however, at this particular meeting I was at, the person didn't show up that day. My daughter's like all over the place and, uh, uh, I, and I'm not able to corral that energy, but really is more bs it's like i really i wanted to go back out you know i wanted mm -hmm. to i mean it was premeditated in my head and, and uh but that was like the oh oh yeah no no these meetings are not good for me look you know i can't even have they can't even be consistent with or whatever you know the excuses the rationalizations i i just like i ended up going to the dealer's house i left the meeting went to the dealer's house and that uh, that became the immediate downfall um within a year of that we lost our house you know we we moved into an apartment um and by selling the house we had a whole bunch of money in the bank uh oh yeah so my daughter's mom and i just it was like nothing was going to stop us from getting loaded every day as much as we want the only thing that could stop us is when our dealer runs out you know right. so <laughs> so yeah yeah so um so that was, uh, so your question was, 
what was going to get me to stop, I guess. Right. Like what, what, what happened that, that finally, you know, and it's like, you know, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was bad. It was dark. That was a dark period. You know, it yeah. was the, the, the winter time. It's like, we have nothing. I, I'm not employable. I, I ended up with like a, a temp job. And even when I peed to get the temp job, it, it came up opiates and they were like, what's this? And I said, Oh, I, I have a, uh, uh, restless leg syndrome. And they prescribed me, you know, it's like, everything I was doing was false and it, it was just going down a dark road. And I had, uh, uh, went for a walk with my daughter's mom, my wife at the time. And, um, I just said, we're, we're killing ourselves here and we need to stop. And she said, screw that man. And I'm like, what? And she's 18 years younger than me. Um, and she said, I'm just getting started, man. You got to party your whole life. You stop. And yeah. I, and I said, I can't, I mean, I can't, if you don't, I can't. I, I, I said, I'm ready to die doing this. I'm ready to OD. I'm ready to just go out. And I really want you, I really need to know before I do that, because I know I can't stop. I really need to know that you're going to take care of our daughter. And wow. So you were ready to die. I was ready. Wow. And, uh, she was like, screw you. <laughs> she and, and she was uh, like, no, nope. yeah, no, she was like, no. And I, and I was just like, what the hell's wrong with her? You know? And, uh, anyway, I went to work that next day, came home from work and my apartment was empty. My daughter and my wife were gone Wow. and, uh, I got a phone call and, uh, and I said, the first thing I said to her is like, where the hell are our pills? Oh, that was the first question. That's where I was, you know, that mm -hmm. was my, my yeah. reality. And, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, our bank account was at nothing. And so those last like couple pills were like, everything. Hey, I can, I can survive this. I just need to get high. And, uh, I, and I said, you need to get your ass home right now. And she said, you don't talk to me that way. And I said, I'll talk to you however I want, you know, you need to get home or I'll kick your ass or beat your ass or something. You know, I said something like a physical threat I gave her, you know, yeah. which, which, you know, isn't okay. That's, I'm trying to remember if that's how I talked to her. It might've been how I talked to her at the time, you know, just like mm -hmm. angry, always threatening violence, you know, or to pull my love away or whatever, you know, it's like all the yeah. games in the book to, to win. And, uh, she said, you know, you don't talk, you don't, like she started screaming, you do not talk to me like that, which wasn't like her. And then, and I said, I'll talk to you however I want. And she said, you will never see your fucking daughter ever again and hung up. Wow. And, and, uh, that was my very first thought was like, I don't want my daughter to grow up without her dad. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know from the life I've led, how, hard that is for women yeah you know to yeah. to 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 like just the the psyche the psyche of of so many you know girlfriends close friends it's just a really difficult thing and i was like i can't yeah the I can't. girls the girls need their dad for sure yeah yeah and, and I was so is like, that so is that when you got sober like that yeah, was the thing that made that you was get the sober? thing yeah that was the you event. knew that your daughter had to have a parent a sober parent yeah I, I, you know, that, that along with like, there was no way I was going to, there was no way I was going to be in her life again if I'm not, right? you know, I mean, I kind of wasn't, you know, anyway, as right. far as, you know what I mean? Like I was physically there uh, and we were very close. We did everything together. I was always the one that gave her baths and took her to the playground. And, yeah. you know, I was a very involved dad, but I'm still high, you know, I'm, right. you know what I mean? And so, yeah. So, yeah. So, and then, uh, did you, know, you go back to NA? Yes. That was, uh, I, I sat there in my apartment. I looked at the, the four walls and I was just like, you know, I've, I've sabotaged, I've abandoned, I've severed relationships with very, a, a lot of humans, a lot, <laughs> a lot of people that love me, but I'm not going to do this to my kid, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. She's so, you know, she's in it. She's, she was four, three and a half years old at the time, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, man, she don't deserve that. And I said, well, okay, I can call my dealer, you know, or I could go to a meeting and it's easy, easy question to answer, you know, went to the meeting, went to a meeting.
And uh, the, the next day I got served a restraining order. And uh, yeah, um, that just solidified that the only way I'm going to have my daughter back is to stay clean. Yeah. So listen, I know that, um, you know, the, the narcotic, the opiates is a really tough, you know, detox. And and so did you do the did you do it on your own? Did you have to go to a treatment facility? How did you manage through that first 30, 100 days type of thing? I will say this, and I don't know if this serves everybody. Um, I I always feared the third day of withdrawals because of like opiate withdrawal, it's that third day. And I've seen that in, you know, many publications, you know, it's that third day, you hear it all the time at meetings. And I mean, there were so many days I, you know, relapsed after three days, if you want to call that a clean period, you know, because, mm -hmm. because the withdrawals were so, so horrible, you know, yeah. I just, I needed something. And uh, I will say with all I was going through, you know, potential loss of a marriage, the potential loss of, uh, you know, being there for my daughter. Um, I got to the third day and I just was, I wasn't going through withdrawals. I don't know if it's a psychological thing, if withdrawals are just, you know, something like, I will say, and this is like, uh, an opinion. This is my opinion is like, I knew I was done. And I don't know how many times I had said that to myself before, but there was something about this event occurring where it's mm -hmm. like, there, there's no way I'm going back. There's no way. You wow. know, I, 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 I'm lucky I didn't destroy everything. You know, that's amazing. And so you've been clean, so clean and sober ever since. Yeah, ever since. How June twenty sixth, June twenty sixth, two thousand seven. So seventeen years, seventeen years, wow. three months. Congratulations. Just, well, thank you. That's amazing. So I kind of want to talk about you know, being able to stay sober through highly stressful situations. And the premise of your book is really based on, you know, you obviously around the addiction and things like that, but you went through some very stressful periods in trying to gain custody of your daughter. You know, when you were triggered with with anger or going through those situations, how did you manage to stay sober, to stay grounded? What was that process like? I cover that somewhat in the book is the period we're talking about now is it's about a year, year and a half period that, you know, the memoir is retelling. Sure. Uh, I mean, that's, it's kind of emotional. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I will say, so I went back and did a, uh, an audio version. I decided to record it myself. It should be coming out soon. And, mm -hmm. and it's one thing to write a story and relive that. Um, but man, <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe I'm trying to avoid getting too emotional. Like I was in tears reading some of the story, I you bet. know, for, for the audio version. Um, so yeah, there were, there were, uh, moments and, and some of those moments were, um, you know, getting a restraining order and was like, Oh my God, what do I do? I've, I've never been arrested. I've never been involved in, uh, the legal system. Mm -hmm. And, I feel very fortunate and blessed that, you know, and grateful that I wasn't because I'm, I'm absolutely certain I would have been the type of person that, you know, carried that as a, a thing that I do if I got caught and got, you know, that interaction oh, with the law. Yeah. Like if I get, if I get arrested or caught, then I'll use type of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I heard a commercial on the radio and I start seeing all these things as, you know, God shots or, you know, mm. God's, God's guidance, my higher powers guidance, you know, like, so I call this this uh divorce for men or something you know one of these like radio ads you know and mm -hmm. and uh um and i i ended up with this woman that was new to being a lawyer um with child custody cases and she was oh my god she was great i mean she was like a fighter and she uh because she was new she had time to like give me advice and help me through these things and and i just think that like having that the meetings, the recovery, people in recovery, you know, I mean, not everybody's perfect in recovery. You know, you could talk to, this would be true for women too. Like I would talk to a man and he was like, oh, fuck that, you know, those women there, you know, and it's like, dude, I don't want nothing to do with all that crap. You know, it, it's like, I don't, I don't hate my daughter's mom. 
I understand what she did and why she did it. I just want to make sure to get in my daughter's life, make sure that I can. And as you know, time unfolded, my daughter's mom's an addict and she's still using and she's still making these bad choices. And uh, you know, we have a we have a hearing for the restraining order. The judge drops the restraining order and gives me a couple days a week. And that just keeps growing by default of her using. Um, um yeah. So I think it was just like be patient. Mm-hmm. Um, don't try to control the situation, accept the consequences of your behavior, my behavior, you know, accepting the consequences. Like I, I put myself here, nobody else put me here. And, and I, and I believe that was really what helped for the most part, you know, and then in, interacting with people in the fellowship. Um, cause at that point I'm so new in recovery, get a sponsor. I start working the steps. But, you know, that stuff takes time to really it like time. like dig into the root, you know, the fiber of who you are. And then I, I had an event uh, where my daughter got harmed on her mom's watch. And I mean, I had gone to a judge to try to get emergency custody order. And the judge, la- you know, she laughed at me. She was like, do you have proof that your daughter's mom's using and I said, I mean, I'm working full time. How am I supposed to get proof? I can't hire. Like, I have no money. <laughs> you know, I, 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 no, I don't. And she was like, well, you made a fool of yourself coming in here. And, and there were all these uh, women in the courtroom that were, their cases went before mine that were getting restraining orders. And, you know, the judge kind of didn't really want to let some of them have restraining orders because it was more or less being used as a tool to like, make sure they got the kids instead of to protect them. And, and I'm not saying restraining or restraining orders are a powerful tool for abusive people, you know, to keep, to keep somebody that's a victim of that safe, they should never be used as a way to like gain custody or, right. you know, and knowing that like, I'm the type of person that's integrity, integrity, integrity. That's the value I was given by my parents, you know? And it's like, I, I can't be the pot calling the kettle black. I can't, you know, use the justice system to try to get back at my ex-wife, you know, my my daughter's mom. And the judge even asked me that. Are you are you doing this to try to, you know, because there's a lot of men that come in here and do that. And I'm like, no, I would never do that. Like, and she said, well, the judge said, well, because you have brought this to my attention, I have to report it. I'm a mandatory reporter. So yeah that got things rolling as far as child protective services got involved and they came to okay. see my, my house and where I live and where I have my daughter four days a week. But on those other three days, you know, my daughter's subject to my ex-wife's behavior, you know, with her addiction. And yeah, eventually uh, my daughter got abused on, uh, with, on, on her mom's watch. And yeah. that was enough for the state to to determine that I should have custody. Wow. That was it. And you've had custody of her ever since. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's 21 now. So nice. um, Yeah. But, uh, and, and I will say like that, that, that get together of, um, so she was, my daughter was inappropriately touched by a man who was in bed with her mom. Um, and, our daughter got in bed with them and then this guy maybe accidentally, I don't know, but she, she told me right away, which is what, you know, what I raised her to do. If anybody ever, you know, right. and you know, I would say that, you know, all parents like let your kids know it's okay to tell you about if somebody touches you inappropriately, you know, it's, it's, Absolutely. it's, a, it's a matter where uh, authorities need to get involved, you know, cause there's experts on this kind of stuff. And so the day after, um, I mean, we we brought her down to the hospital to get her looked at, and then they said we need to do something called play therapy, which is going to determine, you know, what was the extent of the inappropriate behavior. And when that was all said and done, I mean, they took me into a room, and uh, there was like a good cop, bad cop situation where they're, you know, asking me all these questions, and it's a two-way mirror, and I could see like a tripod, and, you know, they ran me through everything they had to run me through. If I wasn't clean... Would have never, never got out of that, right. you know, and that it's yeah. those reinforcements, you know, uh, you know, I'm in this horrible situation, like, you know, 
the person I care more about than anything in this world was just harmed. Yeah. Um, but how good am I to handle that if I'm getting loaded? Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to escape anything. That's the reality. And, and yeah, so they had us meet at the child protective services and the caseworker and, uh, my daughter's mom went, she went berserk. I mean, she like ripped my beard hairs out. She physically out. attacked you? Oh, yeah. And I was like. In front of you, the yeah, officials? And, yeah. And I'm like, are you guys not doing, like, if this was a man, what would happen in this in this case? Right. You know? If she did that in front of them, what would she do in yeah. private? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Interesting. Some horrible so times. It's, it's been a long time since uh, you had custody of your daughter or whatever happened. Well, maybe I don't know if this is relevant, but what happened to the mom? Did she ever get sober? Well, uh, she had some periods where she okay. did. Yeah. I, is, your, lot... is your daughter still in contact with her mom? Uh, again, they have periods where they go in and out of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I've always encouraged my daughter to have that relationship. Um, I, I mean, I don't even know the depth of how much she's been hurt by her mom's absence. I'm sure, you yeah. know, um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, a key to guiding my recovery is compassion. I mean, if Absolutely. she had not, if she had not done that, if she had not left with our daughter, I'd probably be dead, yeah. you know? So I'm grateful to that, you know, that decision of hers to do that. Yeah. And mo most people, I don't know, maybe most people probably wouldn't be, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know the toxicity of uh of, like a resentment or yeah it's like, for sure I, I would just hurt myself if i hated her for that you know absolutely um, yeah no anger is one of those things that needs to be you know processed and dealt with i know the literature a lot of times talks about how it's uh, anger is a you know better left to you know, more qualified people, but it's really important to learn how to process and it's not spiritual bypassing it's actually you know, digging in and getting to the root cause of the issue to be able to resolve it rather than, you know, just suppress it or pretend like it's not happening. So yeah, that's all yeah. that really speaks volumes to your recovery that you did the work. Yeah, I was hesitant. I, I want to say something. Um, and it's not it's not directed at you. It's This is a question I get all the time. It's like, what happened to your daughter's mom? And I, I don't know. I'm just going to I'm just going to say this it's like would you ask a woman the same thing whatever happened to your daughter's dad absolutely okay i just <laughs> I, and that's what i mean it's not directed to you because i i know you well, well i don't know you would but i i i think there's a lot of people that don't consider like you know a mom and a dad they're both equally important um yeah you that's know, what i was thinking because a, a woman you know needs her mom too she's the example yeah. of what she's supposed to be like and you know um the reason i ask about you know the mom being sober or whatever happened to her because uh it's like did that relationship get healed or did your daughter have to learn how to manage you know a an addict parent right that's that's rough right yeah yeah well you know there's programs for that that's what right. ACA is for but um yeah, there's a yep. lot of ACA is good yeah, the adult children. It's yeah. uh, adult children of alcoholics slash dysfunctional families. I didn't learn until recently that it's also for people with dysfunctional families. But no, I'm I was always I'm always curious about, you know, um, you know, both parents because it does affect how your daughter um, you know, moves throughout the world and you know, it speaks a lot to her state, you know, after yeah. all of everything that had happened. Yeah, yeah. I you know, her and I, we are so close. We're close still. So she just had a baby back in December. Nice. Um, you know, so I'm a grandpa. <laughs> and, I, uh, and her husband is in recovery. So, um, right. And, and it's, it's, it's like, you know, the, the cyclical, you know, the disease, I brought her to meetings for years. And so that rhetoric is in her head, you know, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I tried, many times well okay i tried a few times to get therapy for her because I, I i don't think she's addressed her feelings on this and uh well i mean you know i'm sure she has in her way because that's kind of how i am too yeah uh, you know i mean she she you know undoubtedly picked up a lot of things i do <laughs> or my behaviors uh 
good and bad. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that, it's a big thing for her that it's still there and yeah. uh, hasn't, I don't think hasn't been addressed, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I didn't mean to say that, you know, would you ask a woman that question? What I mean to say is like, um, it's potential for a next book because that is probably what most of you are curious, like what happened to the mom um, and what happened to their relationship? And, you know, my best answer is she's come in and out just like so many of us do that are still active in our addiction. You know, it's, yeah. um, you know, she's, she's tried, she's disappeared for extended lengths of time. And that was really hard for my daughter when she was, you know, five, six, seven, eight, like those were the oh, hardest times, yeah. you know, to, to wow. watch that, watch that little girl crying, you know, yeah. where's my mom and not being able to solve that. Cause you know, want to solve that, you know? Yeah. Can't fix that for her. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, it sounds like you've really done a lot of work to heal yourself. And I think this book is going to be um, a great, I don't know if it's like a tool, but I think it'll be really helpful for people to, especially dads, to see that, you know, you can get sober, you know, some people get sober for their kids, you know, like that can really happen. And yeah. you can stay sober despite a lot of, you know, really dramatic things happening, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of stress, which really triggers people. So I think it's a, a great testament to being able to stay sober in the long yeah. run. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, that's probably my favorite feedback that I've gotten um, from people like my friends that have read the book. Yeah. Um, Cause it, you know, almost undoubtedly comes up that they know somebody that's either died, overdosed or right. are, are really in the midst of like heavy alcoholism. And that's the feedback I'm getting is like, this helped me understand their mindset, you know, yeah. because that's, that's, that's how I wrote it was I, I re rewrote, re remembered uh, my mindset my mm -hmm. mindset, you know, the, the, how I rationalized not showing up on time all the time, you know, yeah. or, you know, uh, and so I wanted people who aren't addicts or alcoholics to like have that insight, um, you know, of the, the mindset, the mindset of the addict. Yeah. You know, hope, yeah. hoping no, that's that really will, helpful. yeah, to shed some light for them, you know, outside of, uh, you know, professional or clinical help, you know, stories. Yeah. Stories, yeah. stories are what like, people right? relate to. Memoirs and podcasts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, right? Yeah. So tell me, how can people get a hold of you? Like they can find your book. Do you have a website where you like to direct people to? I do. So the website is Paul Summers, J-R as in junior, dot com. And that's Summers with a U like summertime. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, I mean, that's that's the best way. I mean, I'm on Facebook. And I'm on Instagram mostly. Uh, those are my two social media go-tos. A uh, little bit on YouTube. And then, of course, you know, you can buy the book on Amazon or through the website to get an autographed copy. Nice. And then there's, there's one thing else I want to say. You can go to your local bookstore, like your mom and bookstore, and you can order it there. And they would be able to get a copy. So... Want to want to pump good. pump up yeah I want to pump up the mon pa, you know <laughs> yeah I mean, seriously let's though, our you know, local bookstore so yeah, yeah yeah the brick and mortar I mean there's nothing better than being in a bookstore you know <laughs> and so yeah that would do a lot like for many people so yeah absolutely well Paul thank you so much for spending another session with me it was so yeah, good Arlena, to see thank you. you thank you for sharing you. your story and I I just know that it's going to help a lot of people yeah thank you so much for having me on and it's like. I mean, I I really enjoy when we start talking. It's yeah, it, it becomes I, I think always about how we can help somebody else, you know, and that's always that's, you know purely the reason why I wrote this book. So awesome, yeah. Well, All like right, we'll land the plane there. Thank you Let's so much, it. and I'll look forward to uh, talking to you next time. <laughs> <laughs>
www.thepeacekeepersmovement.com. And if you do, I hope you enjoy it.